I greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to this special service uh, with Grace Communion, and uh, especially welcome to all our guests. And uh, it seemed like a food festival this morning, and then it seemed like a music festival, right? So uh, we are richly blessed indeed today to be inspired by uh, so many uh, wonderful things. And indeed, it's uh, just so fitting, you know, to be able to uh, have this celebration. So thank you all for joining us this morning and worshiping with us uh, our risen Lord. I especially want to thank our trustees and uh, our pastor Sachin and his wife, uh, who have taken the time to come and uh, sacrificed to be with us. And so it does make a difference. I know food makes a difference and music makes a difference, but the most difference is made by people. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, not to get a shouting from uh, our Elder Emeritus Franklin Poppins, I made sure I had my jacket on. <laughs> right. <laughs> just, just kidding. So uh, he wants to see speakers here well dressed. So um, this morning I had to wake up early to attend the worship at the St. George's Church, the Anglican Church in Hyderabad, and uh, uh, it was uh, well attended and uh, a very inspiring service uh, in many ways. I didn't realize that they had uh, uh, given me an honorary doctorate. If you see on the, on the slide there, this is the poster they put up on the stage, and they call me Reverend Doctor. <laughs> so uh, here I am, I've graduated. <laughs> right. I thought, I, I, I just found it a little interesting, so I thought I must uh, show you all that, right, so. Right. Well, today we celebrate the most momentous and vital beliefs of our Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. In fact, the Bible is so bold to declare that if the resurrection is not true, our faith is fake, right? Our faith, our religion is false. The Apostle Paul goes on to say, our preaching is in vain. Like we would say today in the 21st century, the, uh, the gospel is fake news, right? We keep hearing about fake news so much. We are false witnesses. Our preaching is useless if indeed the resurrection has not taken place. It all depends on that one single momentous event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Unfortunately, there are those who have chosen not to believe in the resurrection and down through history have tried to disprove that there was anything called a resurrection. Uh, and today, the debate continues. Did he rise from the dead or did he not, right? Books have been written, articles have been written. But I was curious to know why is it that people, or how is it that people formulate theories to sort of discard the truth about the resurrection when 2.4 billion people today on this earth 2.4 billion Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And there are many theories, and I thought I'll just uh, you know, run, run through a few of them. You've probably heard of the swoon theory, right? They said that, oh, he only fainted on the cross. He appeared dead, but he was not dead. He was resuscitated you know, uh, 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 from the cross. There is the impersonation theory. Oh, it was someone else on the cross, not Jesus. Then, of course, the spiritual resurrection theory. 
it was not a bodily resurrection it was just spiritualized away you see the most famous is the theft theory and do you know the theft theory was even believed by the three ladies who went to the tomb they thought that the body was stolen but uh, you know uh, uh, the funny thing is the theft theory you look in the tomb you find the grave clothes right now why in the world would if they brought the body they will leave the clothes there right isn't that strange right i mean like in hyderabad kya mia wo kapde le jana tha na you know we would have said <laughs> uh hallucination theory the appearance of jesus to the many after the post resurrection was all a hallucination they were all imaginations of people and of course then they try to say well the four gospels they are all different that means it's all fake how can all the gospels have so many different things about the resurrection actually it's the other way around if all the four gospel had identical everything identical in terms of words and sentences then we have to wor worry that it was man manufactured right it was obviously wasn't true because an eye witness will give their account on what they see just as an event that takes place and an eye four eye witnesses will give slightly differing views right and so does the resurrection like i was saying even the disciples had a hard time believing that jesus indeed rose from the dead uh if you remember in john's gospel the angels asked mary there were three marys who went i think uh, to the uh, to the tomb why are you crying she answered they have taken away my lord's body so even she believed or thought that the lord's body was stolen all right but interestingly enough uh well even the disciples i should say in fact they called when the when the ladies came back and said the lord is risen the disciple said they did not believe because their words seem like nonsense that is how the new uh, international version puts it it took repeated appearances of jesus to so many people so many witnesses and even to the extent of one having to touch him and you remember who that is the doubting thomas he had to touch him to then believe yes indeed Jesus Christ was resurrected then came the dramatic turn in the lives of those disciples today thankfully we have uh enough scholarly documentation to prove the resurrection is a historical fact because nobody nobody has convincingly disproved it right it is true the tomb is empty except for the grave clothes because it was a bodily resurrection right he is indeed risen now that it is true the question for us is how should the resurrection of jesus christ speak to us uh what should it tell us how should it inform us how should it encourage us perhaps i should say how should it transform us would it transform us like it transformed the disciples in the in, in you know in that first century uh especially in the light of our daily struggles in our difficult situations that many of us if not all of us go through how should it inform our faith will it increase our faith in spite of the you know difficult situations that we come across in our lives will it strengthen our faith i want to discuss just this aspect in the light of the struggles of the disciples i just want to pick up two perspectives of the struggles the disciples had and related to our own stories of our lives i i can identify two emotions or two emotional condition or two emotional responses that the disciples displayed 
when Christ was crucified. If you remember, Christ was crucified. He hadn't ushered in the kingdom. He was supposedly the Messiah. He was to bring the kingdom, overthrow the Roman government, but that didn't happen. And when that didn't happen, a sense of emptiness, a sense of darkness, you could say, a, a sense of rejection, despondency, overwhelmed them. You know, that was one uh, response. That was one emotional response of theirs, a sense of emptiness. A second one was fear. They feared when Christ was put on the cross because they believed that now they would be targeted. They are going to, the, these people are going to come after them because they are the ones who went with Jesus all over the, all over preaching, you know, and, and teaching people. Yet, we know that the resurrection of Jesus was the turning point. It, so, it spoke so powerfully to the disciples that they not only overcame their emptiness and their darkness, not only did they overcome their fear, they boldly went out to preach that Jesus had been risen. And they became the pioneers of the Christian faith and the Christian church. Most of us, if not all of us, go through similar situations today, don't we? Is there something we can learn from the disciples? Will the resurrection speak to us like it did the disciples? Let's explore that briefly this morning. I, I spoke about this emotion of emptiness and a sense of darkness that enveloped the disciples when they realized Jesus is no more when he died on the cross. They were heartbroken after the crucifixion. They felt so empty that they returned to their old trades, went back fishing or wherever. They had no sense of hope. They had lost all hope. The promised Messiah did not deliver, right? But like I said earlier, the resurrection changed all that. It spoke so powerfully to them. They stood out and spoke with boldness, preaching what we now call is the gospel. They did it with a sense of purpose. Their emptiness was gone. Their darkness was gone. They were infused with meaning in life. In spite of the hardships they faced. In spite of the fact they had to suffer persecution. Deprivation. And even to the extreme where they, many of them died. They were killed for the sake of the gospel. And so brethren, many of us, if not all of us, struggle with a sense of emptiness, don't we, from time to time. Sometimes it's a sense of darkness that can overwhelm us. We struggle for some purpose in life. We struggle for some sense of meaning. Why am I waking up every morning? Will it be a good day? We might struggle to wake up with a sense of purpose and meaning. Many of you know my sister lost her husband of 45 years, uh, about a year back. And the sudden emptiness in her life, the familiar face gone, the, f the, the voice that she heard, the, his presence gone all of a sudden. And she struggled with that sense of emptiness. The evenings became lonely. Uh, as she woke up every morning, she knew that she wouldn't see him. Uh, and so she, well, continues to struggle. But many of us would do the same, don't we? I mean, some of us have lost loved ones. And there is a se sense of emptiness that uh, we, we tend to feel. Um, it's so sad when young people especially experience this sense of emptiness, right? Just uh, some months back, we came to know of a young girl 
who felt an intense sense of emptiness because of not being given the attention that she wanted at home. She felt so empty that she jumped off the second floor. Thankfully, she survived. And, uh, you know, my wife and I tried our best to provide whatever, uh, whatever we could in terms of giving her a sense of direction, courage to move on. Once again, how about you and me? Do you find yourself struggling? Perhaps it's a lost loved one. Maybe it is hardships of various kinds that, big, that trouble us. Maybe it is a health situation that tends to bring a sense of darkness in our lives. Perhaps it's relational issues that so many in this world struggle with. All I can say is the grave is empty. Jesus is risen. He is alive. And the reason I say that is he and he alone can fill that emptiness. And so, let that empty grave speak to us. In your emptiness, remember, the risen Christ can fill you and can fill that void. Just as Jesus told an em a, a lady who was empty, and you remember the story of the Samaritan woman, who was going through her own difficulties. She would come to the well to fill up water at noontime because she didn't want to be seen by anybody. She felt a sense of shame. She felt a sense of, well, for lack of a better word, emptiness. And yet, when she accosted Jesus, Jesus told her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty, referring to the water from the well. But whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus promises to provide us with the water of life. Allow him to bring that true satisfaction. And so, as we negotiate and struggle through our emptiness in our own lives, perhaps a sense of darkness, maybe a struggle with a sense of purpose in life, a sense of meaning with which you can wake up courageously every morning. Let Jesus fill that void. You see, because new life can even begin in darkness. Notice a baby in a womb surrounded by darkness and yet new life can come there from there. Notice a seed in the ground, darkness under the ground, and yet a sprout can come up. Jesus in the tomb, emptiness, and yet he came out alive. New life bursts forth. You see, in spite of that darkness and emptiness, remember that it may be darkest before dawn, but Jesus has risen. He has conquered the grave. He has conquered darkness and the forces of evil. Invite him afresh into your lives. Even as when we will come and partake of the communion. Let it be a deliberate attempt to invite him. Because he has already invited you. You see, all we have to do is respond to his invitation. Let him become your light. Let him fill your lives and banish that emptiness. Just as we heard in the reading, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. And those choice of words are so powerful. New birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I urge you to let the resurrection speak to you.
because he is alive and he will give us life he will fill your life with that sense of purpose and meaning that you might need even at this moment the second uh, emotion that I mentioned the disciples struggled with was fear fear gripped the disciples after the crucifixion in fact John the Apostle in his gospel says on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders they were quaking in their boots scared out of their pants if so use some uh, colloquial language there they were all shut in they're frightened that they would be picked up next they were confused risked I mean after all they risked their lives for this Jesus they thought he was indeed the Messiah they gave up everything for Jesus and now they were afraid of for their lives they were trying to hide right in fact another uh, Apostle Luke in his gospel says when they were describing these events suddenly Jesus himself stood among them and he said peace be with you it's interesting because Jesus knew how frightened they were but even when he said that notice what it says but they were startled and frightened that shows the kind of condition they were in they were so afraid that even as they saw the sudden appearance they must have said some of them probably from Telangana <laughs> So uh, they were frightened. And Jesus says, why are you troubled? Right? Jesus asked them, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Right? And so, thankfully, the resurrection spoke so powerfully to them from then on that they dedicated their lives for the gospel. There was no turning back now. They knew he was alive, and they knew they needed to march forward. Fear is another dominant factor in the lives of so many. So many of us live with a sense of fear, don't we? Everybody, in some way or the other, live with a sense of fear. For some, it may be mild. For some, it, may, it could be severe or intense. Sometimes it cripples. Fear can cripple you, handicap you to move forward. The fear factor is so pronounced today that one author said, it's like a disease infecting millions of people around the world. Another author said, a culture of fear has gripped many, making us slaves to a sense of fear. We are so fearful, everything every sometimes every every moment right perhaps it's the economy will it stay will it stand will my investments hold perhaps it's health a diagnosis what would it be right perhaps it's the gun culture that exists in some societies and we keep hearing about that on a regular basis don't we from the United States my son who lives in Buffalo, New York, about some months back, 20 minutes away from his house, there was a shooting, a racially motivated shooting, killed several people. And they're all afraid. Will my child return safe? Will I be safe going to a supermarket, right? A sense of fear, even as you step out of your home, you wonder, will there be any kind of protection? The fear of failure is another fear that so many of us struggle with. The fear of performance is so very widespread, especially among young people. Two days back, I read in the newspapers that a 10th class student jumped in a river because of fear of failure. It has reached even 
to that level of human beings having to live with a sense of fear constantly. Not long back I was counseling a girl in our school and several problems were discussed but you know I was shocked when I heard one thing from her. She said, I fear going back home. And I thought to myself, fear going back home where it should be the safest place for a little girl because apparently there was abuse at home, some kind of physical abuse and she would delay going back home. A sense of fear with which people and even young people live. Sad isn't it that we can sometimes fear the people who are supposed to love us. We fear the very people we love. Fear of rejection. So many struggle with this. Right? It could be rejection from a peer group, from friends, from society. That is a fear that many have to negotiate in life. Fear of acceptance. Can so many fear accepting certain things? And in that respect, I was listening to a young woman. Her name is Holly Matthews, a young TV actress, successful, two children, beautiful home. Suddenly, husband diagnosed with brain cancer. The doctors gave no hope. And she had to contend with the fear of acceptance of that reality in her life. So many kinds of fear that we struggle with. Even religion is feared. Those who are religious people struggle with fear. The fear of punishment. The fear of eternal damnation. The fear of judgment. Their whole relationship with God is fear based. And unfortunately even our churches sometimes instill that sense of fear when we are supposed to be preaching a God of love, a God who will leave the 99 as we were singing and even focus on one who needs to be saved. And because of that fear, people are helter-skelter, spending money on rituals and this and that and everything else just to make sure I appease this God. How unfortunate that even our religions teach us to fear. When Jesus Christ says, peace be with you, do not be afraid, because he has conquered death. He tells us not to fear. Even from the very, ad the Garden of Eden, fear started. You remember when God called out to Adam in the garden, where was he? He says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. A sense of fear that so many people live with. Once again, let me go back to our reading in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fail. What is there to fear? Here we have the assurance that we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. And it goes on to say this, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. The safest place in the universe. It's kept in heaven. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We are given a living hope to replace that fear. To instead of fear, we are given a living hope. 
an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, unperishable, indestructible, kept in heaven, like I said. No need to fear of bank failures or robberies of the bank <laughs> because it's kept in heaven. Brethren, the resurrection of Jesus Christ ushers a living hope for you and for me. That does not mean to say that we will live trouble-free lives. I, have, I cannot promise you that there will be no suffering. I cannot promise you a life that is, you know, without any problems or issues. But this I can promise you, that in those difficult moments, in that suffering, we do not have to lose hope because our hope is living. Our hope is living because Jesus Christ is living. He's alive, right? And as the Apostle P, uh, uh, Paul encourages us in Romans chapter 8, for I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Notice, he covers anything and everything under the heavens, under the earth, over the earth, everywhere, under the oceans, in the oceans. He says, we don't have to fear. Why? Because nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May Jesus Christ, resurrected, now at the right hand of God, give us new meaning and purpose in life. Let him fill that emptiness when we struggle through those moments uh, at times. Let him give you the courage that in his love, all fear may be removed. And may Jesus Christ, our Lord, the living Jesus Christ, protect your faith until the coming of the fullness of salvation. At this time, I'd like to invite you to partake of the communion. And we are uh, uh, privileged to have Manoa's family provide us with the elements, as it is now a practice that we will give every family an opportunity to provide communion to the congregation. And today, uh, Manoa and Elizabeth will once again administer uh, the communion. And as they prepare the communion for us, I'd like to read from John chapter 6, beginning in verse 35. And once again, reassuring words from our Lord and Savior. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. Can you imagine that emptiness is filled in Jesus? And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But I'll drop down to verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me. Christ is absolutely certain that he is going to fulfill what he has come for. But he goes on to say, but raise them up at the last day. Raise them up at the last day. Who else? is more qualified to talking about raising up, rising up from the dead. He was the first fruit of the resurrection. Verse 40, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I, I, the resurrected Jesus, the living Jesus, will raise him up at that last day. Believe in Christ. Dear brethren, that is our only hope that can overcome death. 
Praveen is trying to tell me something, but I can't catch it. Sorry? Okay, yes. So what I'll do is at this moment, if uh, Mano and Elizabeth can come forward, and then I will invite those who would like to partake of the communion to also come forward and uh, take, if you can just get uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, remove the covers so that brethren can come forward and take the communion. And then you may go back to your seats and then we'll partake together. Uh, make sure that you tear off the, from the piece of bread that is uh, brought for us. And uh, let us pray as we, uh, and ask for, like we normally do, ask for a blessing on the elements. And I'd like to ask a blessing on uh, Manoa and Elizabeth. Join me as I pray, gracious, loving Father. What a hope, what a living hope we have, Father. We thank you so much that in spite of the troubles of life, in spite of the shortcomings that we experience on a daily basis, in spite of the unfairness we see, we know that there is hope. And that hope is living because we have a, a live Savior, a Savior who is at your right hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you loved us so much that you would come to conquer death, even though we might not understand it in all its ins and outs, but we know that you have conquered death and help us to believe. We pray a prayer of blessing upon Elizabeth Manoa that they have provided these elements in the faith that they have in Christ our Lord. And together we participate and ask your blessings upon it as we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please come forward and take your piece of uh, the, the elements. And then we will partake together. Please go back to your seats and we'll do it together. You may come forward. Yeah.
Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven, who instituted the new covenant, Lord's table, the communion. This bread, let it symbolize Christ who can satisfy our eternal hunger, the bread of and the body of Jesus Christ. Christ on the cross shed his blood that we might be wiped clean, washed clean. May his blood bring us eternal redemption, the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> 